Hi everyone, welcome to Melon Void. My name is Harold, and today I'm going to read Marie Lou's War Cross. We're going to look at the preview, and we're going to start from chapter 1. The obsession started 10 years ago, and its fan base now spans the globe. Some eager to escape from reality, and others hoping to make a profit. Struggling to make ends meet, teenager hack teenage hacker Amika Chen works as a bounty hunter, tracking down Warcross players who bet on the game illegally. But the bounty hunting world is, is a competitive one, and survival has not been easy. To make some quick cash, Amika takes a risk and hacks into the opening game of the International Warcross Championships, only to accidentally glitch herself into the action and become an overnight sensation. Then she's going to be arrested, and Mika is shocked when instead she gets a call from the game's creator, the elusive young billionaire, Hideo Tanaka, with an irresistible offer. He needs a spy on the inside of this year's tournament in order to uncover a security problem, and he wants Mika for the job. With no time to lose, Mika whisks off to Tokyo and thrusts into a world of fame fortune that she's only dreamed of, but soon her investigation uncovers a sinister plot with major consequences for the entire Warcross Empire. In this sci-fi thriller, number one New York Times best-selling author, Marie Lu conjures an immersive, exhilarating world, choosing who to trust may be the biggest gamble of all. Chapter 1 there's not a person in the world who hasn't heard of Hideo Tanaka, the youngest mastermind who invented Warcross when he was only 13. A global survey released today shows that a staggering 90% of people ages 12 to 30 now play on a regular basis, or at least once a week. This year's official Warcraft championships are expected to draw more than 200 million views. Correction. In earlier versions of the story, mistakenly described Heidi Tanaka as a millionaire. He is a billionaire. The New York Digest. Manhattan, New York, New York. It's too damn cold of a day to be out on a hunt. I shiver, tug my scarf up higher over my mouth, and wipe a few snowflakes from my lashes. Then I slam my boot down on my electric skateboard. This board is old and used, like everything else I own. Blue paint almost entirely scra scraped off to reveal the cheap silver plastic underneath. But it's not dead yet, and when I push my heel down harder, it finally responds, jerking me forward as I squeeze between two rows of cars. My bright, rainbow dyed hair whips across my face. Hey! A driver yells as I'm in the past his car. He glances off my shoulder to see him waving a fist at me with an open window. You almost clipped me! I just turn around and ignore him. Usually I'm a nicer person than this, or at least I would have shouted an apology. But this morning, I woke up to a yellow paper tape to the door of my apartment. It's worth printed in the largest font you can imagine. 72 hours to pay or vacate. Translation, I'm almost three months behind on my rent. So, I'm going to get my hands on $3,450. I'll be homeless and in the streets by the end of the week. That's how the damn for anyone's day. My cheeks sting from the wind. The sky beyond the cut of skyscrapers is gray, turning grayer, and in a few hours this flurry of snow will become a steady ball. Cars jam the streets, a non-stop trail of brake lights and honking from here all the way to Times Square. The occasional scream of traffic controllers whistle above the chaos. The air is thick with the smell of exhaust, and steam bills from an open vent nearby. People swarm up and down the sidewalks. Students coming home from school are easy to spot, their backpacks and fat headphones dotting the crowds. Technically, I should be one of them. This should be my first year of college, so I started skipping class after dad died, and I hopped out entirely several years ago. Okay, fine, technically, I expelled. But I swear I would have quit anyway. More on that later. I looked down at my phone again, my mind returning to the hunt. Two days ago, I got the following text message. New York Police Department alert. Arrest warrant out for Martin Hamer. Payment, $5,000. The police are so busy these days with increasing crime in the streets that they don't have time to hunt for petty criminals on their own. Petty criminals like Martin Hamer, who's wanted for gambling on war crops, stealing money, allegedly selling drugs to fund his bets. So, about once a week, 
top send out a message like this. A promise to pay anyone who can catch the colonel in question. That's where I come in. I'm a bounty hunter. One of many in Manhattan. And I'm flying to capture Martin Hammer before another hunter can. Anyone's ever fallen in hard time to understand the nearly constant stream of numbers that run through my mind. Month's rent in the worst apartment in New York. $1,150. A month's food. $180. Electricity and internet. $150. Boxes of macaroni, ramen, and spam left in my pantry. Four. And so on. On top of that, I own $3,450 in unpaid debt. $6,000 in credit card debt. The number of dollars left in my bank account? $13. Not the normal things a girl my age worries about. I should be freaking out over exams, turning in papers, I get up on time. I haven't exactly had normal adolescence. $5,000 is easily the biggest, is the largest bounty in months. For me, you might as well have all the money in the world. So, for the last two days, I've done nothing but track this guy. I lost four bounties in a row this month. If I lose this one too, I'm gonna be in real trouble. Tourists are always clogging up the streets, I think, as the detour forced me down the path right into Times Square. I get stuck behind a cluster of auto taxis jammed at a pedestrian walkway. I lean back on my board, pull myself into a halt, and start inching backward. As I go, I glance down my phone again. A couple months ago, I succeeded in hacking into the main directory of work for cross players in New York and synced it all up to my phone's maps. It's not hard, not if you remember that everyone in the world is connected in some way to everyone else. It's just time consuming. You worm, you worm your way into one account and branch out to the friends and their friends. Eventually, you're able to track the location of any player in New York City. Now, I finally managed to place my target to physical location. My phone's a cracked, beat up old thing with an antique battery that's on its last legs. It keeps trying to sleep in order to save energy. The screen is so dark I can barely see anything. Go. I mutter, squinting at the pixels. Finally, the poor phone lets out a pitiful buzz, and the red location marker updates on my map. I make my way out of the taxi jam and push my heel down on my board. It protests for a moment, and then speeds me forward, a dot in a sea of moving humanity. Once I reach Times Square, screens tower over me, surrounding me in a world of neon and sound. Every spring, the official War Cross Championships kick off with a huge ceremony. The two teams of top-ranking players compete in an all-star opening round of War Cross. This year's opening ceremony happens tonight in Tokyo. So all the screens are War Cross related today, showing a frenzied rotation of famous players, commercials, and footage of last year's highlights. Frankie Dina's last, latest, craziest music video plays on the side of one building. She's dressed like her Warcraft avatar in a limited edition suit and web glitter cape. A dan- and dancing with a bunch of businessmen in bright pink suits. Underneath the screen, a group of excited tourists is stopped to pose for photos of some guy dressed in fake Warcraft gear. Another screen features five of the superstar players competing in tonight's opening ceremony. Ash Wayne, Kento Park, Jenna McNeil, Max Martin, Penn Wachowski. I cram my neck to admire them. Each one is dressed from head to toe in the hottest fashion of the season. They smile down at me, and I'm big enough to swallow the city. As, and as I look on, they're all hold up, they all hold up cans of soda. The claim Coca-Cola is their drink choice during game season. A marquee of text scrolls below them. The top Warcross players arrive in Tokyo, poised for world domination. Then I'm through the intersection and cut onto a smaller road. A target's little red dot on my phone shifts again. Looks like he's turned onto 38th Street. I squeeze my way through another few blocks of traffic before I finally arrive, pulling over along the curb beside the newsstand. The red location dot now hovers over the building in front of me, right at a cafe's door. I take my scarf down by a sigh of relief. My breath fogs, fogs the icy air. I whisper. Allowing myself a smile as I think about up to $5,000 bounty. I hop off my electric skateboard, pull out its straps, and swing over my shoulder so I bumped against my backpack. It's still warm from use and the heat of it seeping through my hoodie, and I arch my back to save it. As I pass the newsstand, I glimpse the magazine covers. I have a habit of checking them out, searching for coverage of my favorite person. There's always something. Sure enough, one of the magazines featured him prominently. A tall young man lounging in 
trousers, that's the dark trousers and crisp tom shirt. See, it ca ca casually rolled up to his elbows, the face obscured by shadows. Below him is a logo for Henta Games, War Cross's parent studio. I stopped to read the headlines. Hideo Tanaka turns 21 inside the private life of the War Cross crew. My heart gets a familiar beat of my idol's name. Too bad there's no time to stop and flip through the magazine. Maybe later. I reluctantly turn away, adjust my backpack and board higher on my shoulders, and pull my hood to cover my head. The glass window pa I pass reflects a distorted version of myself. Face elongated, dark jeans stretched too long, black gloves, beat up boots, faded red scarf wrapped around my black hoodie. My rainbow color hair spills out from underneath my hood. I try to imagine this reflected girl pulling down the cover of the magazine. Don't be stupid. I push the ridiculous thought away as I head towards the cat phase entrance, choosing my thoughts inside to the running checklist of tools in my backpack. One, handcuffs. Two, cable launcher. Three, steel tipped gloves. Phone. Four. Phone. Five. Change of clothes. Six. Stun gun. Seven. Books. One of my first hunts, my tiger throw up all of me after using my stun gun, number six, on him. I started change, bringing a change of clothes, which is number five, after that. Two targets have managed to fight me, so, so after a few tetanus shots, I added the gloves, number three. The cable launcher, number two, is for getting into hard to reach places and catching hard to reach people. My phone, number four, is my portable hacking assistant. Handcuffs, number one, are there because, well, obviously. And the book, number seven, is for whenever the hunt involves a lot of waiting around. Entertainment that won't eat up my batteries is always worth bringing. Now, I step into the cafe, soak in the warmth, and check my phone again. Customers are lined up along the ca counter displaying pastries waiting for one of the four auto cashiers to open. Decorative bookshelves line the walls. A smattering of students and tourists sit at the tables. When I point, I point my phone's camera at them, I can see their names hovering over their heads, meaning none of them had set themselves in private. Maybe my target isn't on this floor. I wander past the shelves, my attention shifting from table to table. Most people never really observe their surroundings. Ask anyone what the person sitting nearby was wearing, Chances are good that they can't tell you, but I can. I can say to the outfits and demeanor of every person in that coffee line can tell you exactly how many people are sitting at each table, the precise way someone's shoulders hunch just a little too much. The two people sitting side by side who never say a word. The guy who was careful not to make eye contact with anyone else. I can take in a scene like the tower for my take in a landscape. Relax my eyes, analyze the full view all at once, search for my point search for the point of interest and take a mental snapshot and remember the whole thing. Look for a break in the pattern. The nail that protrudes. My gaze pauses on a cluster of four boys reading on the couches. I watch them for a while, waiting for signs of conversation for the hint of notes being passed by hand or phone. Nothing. I turn to go to the stairs leading to the second floor. No doubt other hunters are closing in on this target too. I have to get up get to them before anyone else does. My steps quicken as I head up. No one is here, so it seems. Then I notice the faint sound of two voices at a table in the far corner, tucked behind a pair of bookshelves to make them almost impossible to see from the stairs. I am moving closer on silent feet, and peek through the shelves. A woman is seated at the table, her nose buried in a book. A man stands over her, nervously shuffling his feet. I hold up my phone. Sure enough, both of them are set to private. I slip to the side of the wall so they can't see me, and listen closely. I don't have until tomorrow night, the man is saying. Sorry, the woman replies, but it's not much I can do. A boss will release that kind of money to you without taking extra security measures. Not when the police have an arrest warrant for you. You promised me. And I'm sorry, sir. The woman's voice is calm. <laughs> the voice is calm. The voice, woman's voice is calm and cynical, like she has to say this countless times before. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's game season. The authorities are on high alert. I have 300,000 notes with me. Do you have any idea what that's exchanging for? Yes, it's my job to know. The woman answers in the driest voice I've ever heard. 300,000 notes. That's about $200,000. As the current exchange rate. Higher roller, high roller this one. 
gambling on war crimes is illegal in the United States. It's one of the many laws the government has recently passed in a desperate attempt to keep up with technology and cybercrime. If you win a bet on a war cross match, you win game credits called notes. But here's the thing, you need to take those notes online or to a physical place. Or you meet a teller like this lady. You take your notes to her. She gives you the real cash in return while taking a cut for her boss. It's my money. Guys, this is the email. You have to protect yourselves. Extra security might be taking time. You come back tomorrow night. We can exchange half of your notes. I told you. Don't have to until tomorrow night. I need to leave the city. The conversation repeats itself all over again. My breath is frozen. The room has all but confirmed his identity. My eyes narrow. My lips turn up into a hungry little smirk. That's that. This right here is the moment I lived with you during the hunt. When the bits and pieces I've exposed, I've exposed, converge into a fine point. When I see my target standing physically before me. Right for the paper when I solve the puzzle. God. After the conversation turns more urgent, I tap my phone twice and send a, out a text message to the police. Suspect in physical custody. I get a flight almost immediately. NYPD alerted. I pull a stun gun out of my backpack. It catches one of the edge of the zipper, making the famous scraping sound. The conversation halts. Through the bookshelves, both a man and a woman jerk their heads toward me with deer and headlights. The man sees my expression. His face is covered in a sheen of sweat. His hair is plastered in his forehead. A fraction of a second passes. I shoot. He bolts. Listen by a hair. The woman darts up from her table, too. I could care less about it. They race after him. He hops down the stairs three at a time, nearly falling in his rush, scattering and falling a bunch of tents behind him. He sprints for the entrance as I reach the first door. I burst through the revolving glass door right behind him. We emerge onto the street. People let us start shouts as a man shoves him aside. He knocks a camera clicking Taurus flat on her back. In one moment, I swing my electric board to the ground, jump on, and slam my heel down as hard as I can. It makes a high-pitched whoosh. I lunge forward, speeding down the sidewalk. The man glances over his shoulder to see me gaining fast on him. He darts left down the street at a full panic run. I veer in his direction at such a sharp angle that at the edge of my board protests against the pavement, leaving a long, long black line. I aim my stun gun at the man's back and shoot. He shrieks and falls. Instantly, he tries to stand again, but I catch up to him. He grabs my ankle. I stumble, kicking at him. His eyes are wild, his teeth clenched, his jaw tight. Out flashes a blade. I see its glint in the light just in time. I kick him off me and roll away before he can stab at my leg. My hands get a grip on his jacket. I fire stun gun once more, once more, this time in a close range. It hits true. His body goes rigid. The end, he collapses in the face, trembling. I jump on him. My knee pressed hard to his back as the man stops on the ground. The sound of police rounds the bend. A circle of people gathered around the ground. The glass is break, recording away. I didn't, I, I didn't do anything. The man whispers over and over again. His voice comes up garbled by how I'm pushing him to the ground. Ladies, be charged. I can give you her name. Shut it. I cut him off as a slight handcuffs onto the trip. To my surprise, he does. They don't always listen like that. I don't relent until a police car pulls up until I see red and blue lights flashing against the wall. Only then do I get up and back away from him, making sure to hold on my hand so the cops can see him clearly. My skin tingles from the rush of a successful hunt as I watch two policemen yank the man onto his feet. Five thousand dollars. When was the last time I even had half that much money at once? Never. I'll get to be less desperate for a while. I'll pay off my rent. What that I owe. We should call my landlord down for now. Then I have one thousand five hundred fifty dollars left. It's a fortune. My mind flips through my other bill. We don't be eating the other day for meals tonight. I want to do a victory jump in the air. I'll be okay until the next one. It takes me a moment to realize that the police are walking away from these taxes without even looking in my direction. I smile. Hey, officer! I shout, hurrying over, hurrying after the postman. Are you gonna give me a ride to the station for my payment or what? Can I just meet you there? The officer gives me, the officer gives me a look that doesn't seem to jive with the fact that I that just cost them a criminal. She looks exasperated and starts to under her eyes, telling me she hasn't gotten much better. We weren't first. I start, I startle, thinking. 
What? I say. Another hundred thousand more before me. For the moment, all I could do is stare at her. Then I spit out a swear. What a load of bull! You saw the whole thing go down. You all confirmed my alert! Oh, the phone the officer someone officers can see the text message I received. Sure enough, that's when my Barry, phone's Barry, finally dies. Not that the proof would have made a difference. The officer doesn't even glance at the phone. It was just an auto reply. According to my messages, I received the first call from another hunter on location. Bounty goes to the first. No exceptions. She offers me a sympathetic shrug. This is the dumbest technicality I've ever heard. The hell it does, I argue. Who's the other hunter? Sam? Jamie? They're the only other ones canvassing this turf. Throw my hands up. You know what? You're lying. There is an other hunter. You just don't want to pay out. I follow that. She turns away. I saved you from a dirty job. That's the deal. That's why any bounty hunter goes after the people you're too lazy to catch. You owe me this one and you... The cop farting and grabs my arm and shoves me so hard that I nearly fall. Get back, he says with a smile. Amika Chen, isn't it? He's the other hand wrapped tightly on the grip of my shoes. Yeah, I don't think you I'm not about to argue with a loaded weapon. Fine, fine. I force myself up to take a step back and raise my hands in the air. I'm going, okay? I'm leaving you. I know you already got some jail time for you. He's me. That's hard and good earned before joining his partner. Don't make me give you another strike. I hear the police radio calling them away to another crime scene. The noise around me muffles. The image in my mind of the $5,000 starts to waver until it finally blurs into something I no longer recognize. In the span of 30 seconds, I figure it's toss into someone else's hand. I hope you've enjoyed um, hearing me read. I know it started, started a little bit. But if you enjoyed this, I hope you like it. Comment down below and possibly subscribe. If you really want to see more, just follow me on my other page. And I'll see you in the next video. Stay comfy, everybody.